Hey everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the extraordinary honor and pleasure of chatting with none other, the bassist for Foreigner, Jeff Pilsen. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> thank you good to be here man. oh thank you jeff for taking time to chat with us lots of exciting stuff going on in the world of foreigner however we always like to go all the way to the past how did you get started in music and particularly on bass well the way i got started on bass is kind of funny actually this I was, was during sixth grade i was 12 years old and it was on a recess break you know People go out for recess. And a friend of mine and I used to sing a local root beer commercial. This was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was Groff's Root Beer. I remember that. Don't remember how the commercial went. But for some reason, I sang that. And my friend and I did it. And we kind of did a skit with it. And we're kind of entertaining. Anyway, so these after we do that one time, these guys come up to me. And they're like, hey, we're starting a band. Uh, we need a singer. You want to be the singer? I was like, sure. 12 years old. Yeah. Um, they said, and we don't have a bass player. Want to play bass? Sure. <laughs> so I had a paper route at the time. I spent 35 bucks and got a Tiesco Del Rey bass, 35 bucks more, and I got a Gibson Skylark amp, and I was ready to go. Yeah. That's how I started playing bass at 12 years old. Nice, nice. Now, are you self-taught, or do you pursue lessons after that? Well, I've had stuff over the years, and I did go to the University of Washington where I was a music major, although I did not graduate. Um, but, I mean, I've studied plenty, but no, I was most, I, I think most of my teaching has been self-taught. And honestly, you know, I mean, I started off like a lot of guys, you know, just everything that was out there, you know, I mean, Cream, you know, Jack, I love Jack Bruce and things like that. Then very soon I discovered prop. And I became a complete prog guy. And Chris Squire was my absolute guy. Yeah. And I mean, I had a Rickenbacker. I played Rotosound strings. I played through a stack of 12s. I mean, it was nuts. I was so into that whole thing for many years. But I credit Chris Squire for really giving me the ultimate passion. Because once I heard him... I mean, I've, I'd been playing bass a few years at that point and was, you know, serious about it and thought I wanted to do that. But mm -hmm. then that's when it all of a sudden became a manic passion. Um, that just, that sound. And it was roundabout. That was the first thing I heard. And I just went, that's what I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I didn't really know how he was doing it, but I, you know, I could tell it was with a pick. So I started playing with a pick immediately. It, it just changed my life. And it gave me so much passion for so many years about bass playing and music that I do, I credit Chris very, very high on the list. Wow. And it's, it is interesting because music was evolving at the same time. Yeah. We were going along kind of in, on the journey. And so if you think back to some of the 60s tunes, you had basically three to four chord tunes. And then when Prague came along, you started seeing some complexities and details that you'd kind of going, wait, this is well above and beyond just these four chords and, and a and lot the of odd time signatures oh and yes that. yeah it wasn't four Very four that. i was just <laughs> so drawn to that <laughs> and, and it had a level of i'll say even an intellectual complexity that you're going okay it's kind of rivaling classical music with what's going on here and i think it created a, a certainly a higher level of like intellectual awareness in the music itself because it just clicked all these different buttons sure and and that prompts better musicality and and there was i mean it's again you know i'm i'm from the school of pro i mean chris <laughs> squire greg lake michael rutherford you know those guys ray shulman mm -hmm. guys that just to me that's they taught me how to play bass really musically and really thinking about melodic lines and counterpoint and just all the stuff that you know, as I started learning more about music in a traditional sense, I realized, wow, these guys are really bringing it. Mm -hmm. And then it did make me want to study for real and do it for real. So and and I will always tell young kids, you know, if you can study music, great, but it starts right here. And it, and then then it goes up to here. But don't don't let this get in the way of this. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think if you get the right professor, the right person teaching you, that can impart that because I do think that a lot of times 
when we're talking about studying music, people will get hung up on theory as an arid, arid desert subject <laughs> that they must traverse through to get to where they want to be right. and not realize the, the, the nuances. And so as they get right. kind of whacked on the head with their the circle of fifths and, and all this, they, they, they just go, I, I would just want, I want to play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, for, I, I, you got to remember, I went to the university of Washington in the mid seventies, which was still the music program. There was still really conservative and it was mm. classical music only. And mind you, I was very into classical music. That was a big thing. And I was studying string bass with the first chair string bass player in the Seattle symphony. So, I mean, it was all great, but that's, all it was yeah and it was you know for a 20 year old kid that just doesn't work and you know i mean i remember one quarter because i read all the music theory books i i was i was very very into this mm -hmm. I, I mean i was taking it seriously you know i mean i was sure i was a young kid and doing too many drugs and everything else but <laughs> but but i was very serious about music and i went an entire quarter where I didn't go to one music theory class. I came in on the day of the finals and I told the professor I wanted to take the final. He said, well, you didn't come to any classes. And I said, it's okay, I think I know the material. I got 100% on that test. Oh, wow. He gave me a C plus ah. because of the attendance, which I thought was not not collegiate. No. <laughs> you know? So anyways, I got disgruntled with school and then became a student of Chris Squire. <laughs> Understandably so. So then since since you were departing from the classical and going more with the prog rock, how did you develop? Obviously, you would have picked up playing with bands. Uh, UW is Washington, Seattle. That's a big music scene there. Uh, what happened next? Well, for a couple of years, I was doing the thing where I would play in a, original bands, you know, and, and we ended up forming a band called Christmas. And we were actually a trio. It was a keyboard player, bass, and drums, although I played guitar some too with a double neck. And, you know, I mean, we were total, the total frog thing, you yeah. know, Moog Taurus pedals, the whole bit. I mean, I was broke, but somehow I had more Moog Taurus pedals. You know? <laughs> and a double, and a 1963 Rickenbacker double neck that I, so I don't know how I got. But anyway, so I, I had, we had this band Christmas, but to survive, because I mean, we went through some periods where we were so broke, but to survive, we ended up forming a lounge band that we called the Merrymakers. <laughs> and we would go around to little lounges in the Seattle area, play gigs, you know, four or five nights a week to make our living. And then during the day, we'd practice with Christmas. It was, you know, but it, it got to the point where we were the classic, really good at rehearsing, never did a gig kind of thing. So w once the gig started happening, it sort of fell apart because there weren't really any. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was kind of that, but it was a tremendous experience and a tremendous brotherhood. The, the guys in that band are still dear friends of mine who I hold in very high regard. The keyboard player is incredible, by the way. Mm -hmm. He was in a band called Cairo that was a, a known prog band for a while. So I did that until everything just fell apart. I moved to San Francisco in the summer of 78, met a guy by the name of Mike Varney who is was very instrumental in things for me at, at the time he had a record deal with a project called or he didn't have the record deal yet it's, the project was called rock justice and it was with marty ballon from the jefferson Air, uh, starship okay and they co-wrote uh, the whole thing they asked me to be the lead singer and bass player on it so that's what i did for much of 78 although the record deal didn't happen and long story short i moved back to seattle for a while to join rejoin christmas came back to uh California to rejoin with Rock Justice, and we did the record in 1980, and that was my foray into the world of professional. You know, it, the the label was EMI, and you know the whole that whole experience. That was my first time experiencing that. Hearing my, you know, I sang the song that was the first single from the record, so I got to hear my voice on the radio, which is pretty cool. Mm. So there's that, but that also kind of plodded on and didn't go anywhere until the spring of '83, moved to LA. First joined a top 40 band for a while, and then ended up joining Dokken. And that was through Mike Varney, the guy that brought me to into Rock Justice. He was the guy that got a call from Don Dokken. Don was saying, hey, do you know of any singing bass players? And Mike <laughs> Varney told him, I know a guy that just moved to LA. So it worked out perfect. Nice. And then how long did you stick around with Dokken? 
I was in Dokken from 83 until we broke up in 89. Okay. Then after that, I had my own band, War and Peace, for a while. And then, of course, <laughs> 1991, the, the critical year where, you know, hair metal died. So <laughs> no matter what I did, I was not going to be able to get a record deal. I was just suddenly completely uncool. So understandable. So that's when I joined Dio in 93 mm -hmm. and had a wonderful few years in Dio. And then in 95, Doc and Gap got back together. We did our dysfunctional record and we played together until 2001, it broke, when I left the band again. Gotcha. Now you joined Foreigner in 2004. Correct. Okay. How did that come about? That came about because after I left Doc and I was in this movie called Rockstar that mm. came out in 2001, we, but we filmed it in 2000. And in the movie with me was Jason Bonham, who's the son of John Bonham, le legendary you know, Zeppelin drummer. Anyways, well, Jason and I really hit it off in the movie, both personally and professionally. We felt great about playing together. We wrote a song together that did, it's not in the movie, but I believe it's on the movie soundtrack. And we just got along. So when he started working with Mick Jones in 2004, at first he wasn't really quite sure, Mick wasn't sure what, it, what he exactly wanted to do. Did he want to do a solo record or whatever? But Jason kind of convinced him to revamp Foreigner. So they called me up, I came down, the chemistry was immediate and I've been here ever since. Nice, nice. Well, and it's kind of an, an eye-opening thing, I think, especially for those of us that grew up during the times of radio, and a lot of times you'd catch a song while it was in progress. You didn't know who was playing. And right. so in retrospect, as I look back, so many of the songs that I really liked were Foreigner. And I, I almost hadn't realized, wait, that's Foreigner? Because you, you, you had the, the roundup of a lot of the, the usual suspects, you know, you, you know, Lover Boy, Journey, Sticks, all Man, this. this and, 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 and all, <laughs> All of these would pop up. And so then as I was coming back and I remember I'd be in school and you'd hear Foreigner in the background. Oh, yeah, I, I like that. That you have Jukebox Hero. Oh, no, I like this. She's cold as ice. Huh? And it's not till kind of it all came together that I really even realized, wow, you know, this is a huge. They had a huge body of work even before you kind of came on, on board with this. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing. People leave our shows all the time saying, I didn't realize how many Foreigner songs I knew. You know, that all the time. Yeah. I will say that Foreigner songs are more famous than Foreigner the band. <laughs> because the songs are, some of them are just part of the social fabric now. You know, Cold Indeed. as Ice, you know, Two yeah. Bucks Hero, uh, Hot Blooded, you know. And, and so the songs have taken on a life of their own, which is very cool. But it's our job to make it make people realize that they're all from foreigners. So come and see us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sixteen top thirty songs. Wow, wow. That's that's, a, that's just a, an impressive number for, for anybody. And especially during a time frame where there were a lot of bands that might be one hit wonders that you'd kind of go, oh, they had there was this one song, and if you go to a concert and they play that one, and then you don't recognize anything else, you're kind of going, well, well, I really like that one. Yeah, <laughs> the one. Yeah, that, this is over. Uh, this is over a. I believe, a, I want to say a 13-year period at 16 top 30 songs. That's pretty amazing. That That that's is just, impressive. That's just crazy. That's just crazy. And the thing is, I get to put the set lists together because I'm the musical director. So I always tell people, it's like cheating. When you got that many great songs, you know, you can't make a bad set. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So as we're speaking, I'll say in the bittersweet realm, after all of this great stuff, you guys are midstream on what is a two-year farewell tour. There may be something going on in 25 we just haven't heard yet. But the, but what I will tell you is at the end of 24 will be the end of our doing long tours. Okay. You know, that That's really what we mean by this farewell tour. We're not going to do the long tours anymore. No more nine months of the year on the road. That will end at the show in Vegas. Okay. There may be some other things happening in 25. We'll see. It's all kind of be to be determined, but, but the gist of it is that we don't want to do those long tours anymore, and that's what's going by the wayside. Yeah. Well, so many people, I get talked to so many people that share that it's the part on the road that's the rough part. I mean, the part on stage is it's what keeps that's you going, true. but 
that's what two hours out of a 24 hour day and those are few in between and then you've got all this other time where it's yeah it's traveling it's family it's all that stuff combined you know we're not that young (laughs) so i mean there is all that Uh, and and basically you don't want to have a life yeah be nice to have more of a life i mean my daughter is in college now i had to miss but, uh, a lot of stuff with her and so i you know i wouldn't mind going home and spending a little more time in my studio because boy do i love to record in my studio <laughs> nice nice well and what i, I one one question that kind of comes to my mind too because the set list and the music was so defined how do you fit in getting your particular sound and were you, have you made any significant changes to because again these are so iconic patterns and things i mean right. you could certainly just slip into the groove and go with the flow and primi- we we mostly like to stick with the album arrangements as much as possible and mm-hmm. and even in the part i mean i love the foreigner bass parts so yeah. i have no desire to change them yeah we of course we do little arrangement things for live and all that you know and we we stretch out some stuff quite a bit and you know we we do what you do for a live act but we do try and stay true kelly stays very true to the melodies because that's what people want to hear you yeah. know and that's what i want to hear i mean i love i love foreigner too i'm a foreigner <laughs> fan you know i that's one of the beautiful things being the musical director but also being a fan you know, that's kind of a cool thing. I, I get to bring the fan's perspective into the band, and I think that really helps. So, no, I don't have to work at getting my sound. I do get a more gnarly, grun- you know, kind of growly sound than the parts that are on the records. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it seems to work in fine for the live live band. I mean, you know, just adding a little bit of growl never hurt anything, yeah. <laughs> I say, on bass. So I didn't have to work in my sound as much. I mean, I did in the early days, you know, I would consult with Mick, like, you know, how aggressive may I be? And he's like, be yourself, you know, do what you do, you know? And it really, I think that's one of the reasons why the live band has become such a successful entity. And we built it back up so far over these nearly 20 years because we breathe new life into the songs, you Mm -hmm. know? And when musicians who listen to each other are given that permission to just be open and play, so much great inspiration comes along. And I mean, the stuff that we come up with together is just fabulous. And it's all because we listen and because the music calls for it. And that's amazing. Nice, nice. And gear wise, how are you producing your sound? All right, so live, I have finally become a Kemper guy. So (laughs) yeah, I love my Kemper. I'm such an SVT guy. I mean, I am an SVT guy and I still have, I have a beautiful 71 SVT at home that records. It's the, it, to me, it's the best sounding SVT I've ever heard mm-hmm. in my life. It, and it cost me a small fortune because I had to have that one. <laughs> <laughs> and the people knew that they could take advantage of me. Anyway, so I still love my SVTs. But live, I'm, I've sampled my 71 SVT and it is a sp- Spot on sample. I can't. I, it was the first time I tried sampling with the Kemper, and I, I couldn't. I nailed. I've tried since, and nothing's as good. <laughs> that first sample that I made of my '71 though is phenomenal, and I use it to this day. I combine that with a Sans amp. Sans amp gets a cleaner. I mean, a, not as clean as the DI sound, but a cleaner sound than the Kemper. But with it's still got a little bit of a. a kind of a nice growl to it, but it's also very clear and present. And then a little bit of DI just to add definition and that's my sound. Nice. Nice. What kind of bass are you playing? And I play P basses live. I mean, I just, I'm just a firm believer in P basses. I have, I I play a 73 live. It's a 73 P bass, but it's got 1966 pickups on it just because I love 60s pickups. Yeah. They're a little bit warmer to me. And it's a maple neck, so it's a very bright bass. It's very, very bright. But those 66 pickups warm it up just enough to soak it into the mix and to a place that I absolutely love. My backup is a 71 P bass. Same thing, 66 pickups on it. Just a, another fabulous bass. So I'm, I'm, I'm lucky with my two P basses that they've worked. I haven't had to use five string with, uh, I, I've recorded with five string with Foreigner, uh, but I haven't had to play it live, so that's not an issue. So mm-hmm. I think I'm probably gonna stay P basses for a while. Nice, and do you have a preference in strings? 
I do. I'm an Apex guy. Apex strings, which, you know, it's Jeff uh, Landtroop who had a lot to do with the Dean Markley Blue Steels. Mm -hmm. And I was a Blue Steel guy. And then when Jeff started Apex, I just, I fell in love with his strings. They're amazing. They really are. I do 50s through 105. Plus, he's helped me out, too, because I have a 10-string bass at home that I love to record with, made by Keith Horn at Marvin Guitars. Hmm. It's a fabulous 10-string. It's just fabulous. And Jeff has helped me sort out all the strings for that. And in my five strings, I've got a beautiful Fender 5 that I absolutely love. It's a newer one, but it just sounds fabulous. It just sounds amazing. And I'll put a probably a 125 on the low B of that. Nice. Yeah. Very, very cool. Well, and as we're looking ahead, we have the second part of the farewell tour with 16 dates, I believe, in at the Venetian in Las Vegas. Yeah. And they're kind of scattered through the year, which is kind of right. cool. So they're not all at once. So if people can plan sometime in 2024, they can have a target date where they can go to yeah. the shows. Yeah. So that's really exciting. And if people want to know where to find it, if they go to foreigneronline.com, that's, that's the, cool. the, probably the, the key place, but all the social media. And of course, if they go to venetianlasvegas.com, they'll find out more specifics sure, sure. on that. Look for the real Jeff Pilsen on Instagram too, you know? Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And other than the foreigner, and as you'd mentioned, you know, hinting there may be more foreigner stuff in the future, you just can't, it's, it's still too far to see. Do you have any other plans of, of your own other than settling down and enjoying a little bit of yeah. <laughs> relax that, time? But I, I plan on doing a lot of recording. I have three main projects that I'm all involved with, all with Frontiers Records. I have Black Swan, which features Reb Beach from uh, Winger and Whitesnake, Robin McCauley, who's uh, MSG, Rating the Rock Vault, amazing singer, and Matt Starr, drummer uh, from Mr. Big and Ace Freely. So that's Black Swan. That's one project I have. I'll probably do more with that. I've got a, a project called The End Machine with George Lynch, my partner in Dokken, Steve Brown, who is the brother of Wild McBrown, who is the drummer from Dokken, and then the singer is a guy by the name of Garish Pradhan, who is from India and who is absolutely otherworldly incredible. Wow. This guy has a voice that has to be heard to be believed. It really is. And he's absolutely incredible and he's a great writer he's a great guy that record's coming out february 9th and i'm very 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 excited about it it's actually our third record but this one is going to be really really spectacular because it's our first with garish so very excited about that and then i have a project revolution saints dean castronova drum from journey and joel hoekstra the uh, guitarist in White Snake. The three of us have a band, Revolution Saints, where Dean sings, and Dean is an incredible singer. It's wow. really amazing. It's kind of like heavy journey. The music is on with Revolution Saints, and and because Dean actually sounds, he sounds just to me like the Separate Ways era Steve Perry. Okay. He really does. He sounds a lot like that, and it's just it's just great stuff. So I'm probably going to do a lot of recording with those projects coming up. Maybe maybe I can even do show. Maybe I'll somehow be able to do shows with some of these projects now that, you know, it, Foreigner won't be touring as much. We'll see. But that and there is some Foreigner music around working around the pipeline that would be great to finish off. Yeah. So I'm hoping in 25 we can do some of that as well. Very cool. Well, and if people want to know more about your own projects, where's the best place for them to look? The um, Jeff Pilsen fan page on Facebook. Okay. Go there. That, that's a, that, actually, that's the best one to go to. Excellent. Excellent. And like I said, the real Jeff Pilsen on Instagram. But as far as info goes, yeah, Jeff Pilsen fan page. Very cool. Well, it's so great to hear all this stuff. We're very excited. Again, I said a little bittersweet that good things come to an end in one aspect, but it's yeah. great to know that we're still going to be enjoying foreigner music, hopefully for a long, long time. I would hope so. <laughs> after that. Well, Jeff, we appreciate you taking time to chat with us out of your busy schedule. Folks, you've seen him here on Bass Musician Magazine, Jeff Pilson. Thank you so much, Raul. Mm -hmm.